Good morning. In this video, I'll talk about the one-on-one -on -one meeting between India and Chinese Defense Minister, which was held on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Defense Ministers Meet, which was held recently in Delhi. Now, in my assessment, the one-on-one -on -one between the two defense ministers, it failed miserably both on protocol and specially on substance. And it has taken the two countries one step closer to a war. A war that neither side wants and a war that the Indian military still does not understand. The Indian military still does not understand that the PLA campaign will be short, swift, intense, sudden, no preparatory time, whole of nation, decisive campaign. If they understood this, they would not be harping on theatrization, trying to aggregate their limited assets and certainly would not be talking about a two-front war, a war with Pakistan and China, the two campaigns which are as different as chalk and cheese. But let's go back to the main theme. As I was saying, it would have been better in protocol if as the host, the Indian Defence Minister, Rajnath Singh, like he shook hands with the other defense ministers of, of the SEO nations, he had done the same with the Chinese defense minister as well, which was not done. But the key issue is the substance, where there is absolutely no meeting ground between the two narratives, one of India and the, China, and the other of the Chinese. Let's look at what Rajnath Singh had to say insofar as the substance is concerned. He made it clear that without peace on the border and peace he defined as disengagement followed by de-escalation. There can be no normalcy between India and China. This he said was imperative. Now what the Chinese defense minister said is entirely different. He made two points. His first point was that the border is peaceful. And there is a need for the two sides to move towards normalized management. And the second point he made was that both the countries need to put the border issue at the right place. Let us discuss both the issues. Now, legally speaking, what the defense minister said on the first point on wanting to move towards normalized management, he is correct. Why correct? Because both the countries, India and China, on the 10th of September 2020, they signed the joint statement in Moscow. From the Indian side, it was signed by Foreign Minister Jay Shankar. On the Chinese side, by the Chinese counterpart, Wang He. And if you read those five points of the joint statement, they do not mention de-escalation at all. And they do not specify which all places the disengagement has to happen. It does not say that it must happen at Depsang and Demchok that the Indian side is now insisting upon should have been there in the joint statement. And it says very clearly that once the disengagement is over, both the sides need to work together for new confidence building measures, which is the new modus vivendi which is precisely what the Chinese defense minister is saying that we need to move towards normalized management. It is another matter that when this was signed, this joint statement on 10th of September 2020, the Indian government and especially the prime minister was under a lot of pressure because of the Kalwan killings. And hence what they put on paper and they signed is absolutely loaded in favor of China. But this is a different story. The story now is that why is India disowning what it has already signed? There are two reasons for that. Reason number one is that India today believes, this is not true, that in a multipolar world, it is one pole and China is another pole. And this is something that Jay Shankar has repeatedly said that India is a pole in the multipolar world. Now, if both the countries are poles in a multipolar world, it stands to reason 
that the three C's are applicable. That means India can do combat with China, that India can compete with China and India will cooperate as and when it suits with China. But this is not the reality. The reality is that the pole that India thinks it is, it has been artificially propped up by the US military, by the support of the US military after the Modi government signed the four military foundation agreements and it became part of the US Indo-Pacific defense networks. That is how it has been propped up. Now, the situation today is that the people who propped us up, they have also now walked back on their narrative on China. And what was their narrative? The narrative right from when Biden administration came into office was of decoupling trade and commerce and technology. And it was about an imminent war on Taiwan. This has been the narrative and it has been walked back. Very recently, the US National Security Advisor Jake Silvian said at the Brookings Institute that we have, without saying it, that their position now is aligned with the position of the European Union. And the European Union position was given by the EU Commission Chief, where she said that Europe should not decouple from China, only de-risk from China. Now, this is a very important statement for the simple reason, when you look at EU and you look at the three prominent nations, Germany, France and Italy, which contribute to more than half of the GDP of the EU, they have very intense commercial and trade ties with China. They don't want to be the losers, so they don't want to decouple. De-risk is looking at certain areas, technology areas, which perhaps will assist the Chinese in areas like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, high-end microchips. So it is in these areas that a high fence has to be erected. This is the position of the EU. And now the Americans have adapted this position for the simple reason that they have realized that the EU is not falling in line. Now, whether it is tactical, we do not know. But as of now, I don't think the Chinese are taking the changed position of the Americans very seriously. Not only this, the Americans have also in their recent House Armed uh, Services Committee, in that committee, the US intelligence chiefs have said that a war with China over Taiwan is neither imminent nor inevitable. So again, they have walked back the position that we do not want. We only want military to military ties so that there is more communication. So this is the position. But India cannot walk back. And that brings me to the second reason why. Because the 2024 general elections are around the corner. And as far as the Modi government is concerned, that is the priority to win those elections. And the priority is not to, and to win those elections, it cannot be seen as weak compared to China. So this is where we stand on the first point made by the Chinese defense minister. Now, let's see his second point that he said, the need to put the border, the border dispute in a proper place. The proper place that he was hinting is actually the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on which sidelines this meeting was held. Because today the Shanghai Cooperation Organization having started at Shanghai 5 in 1996 where their key theme or their key objective was terrorism. Now they have three objectives, important objectives and these are terrorism, cooperative security and connectivity. We need to understand cooperative security and connectivity. Now, cooperative security, which is being backed, which is being backed by two major powers, and those major powers are China and Russia. Now, China and Russia and US, they are not any other powers. 
they are what I call the geostrategic players, which means that they have the capability, capacity and political will to influence events way beyond their borders. So here we have a narrative where two geostrategic players, China and Russia are backing the cooperative security narrative and against the American narrative which is of integrated deterrence. Integrated deterrence is what the US Indo-Pacific Command is out to achieve. Now, the first thing that strikes about these two narratives is that A, you have two geostrategic powers on one side, it is heavy. Let us not underestimate Russia. It may be a lesser geostrategic player, but it remains a geostrategic player nevertheless. So geography is on, the, on, the, on, on their side. There are two geostrategic players on that side and most of all, which is perhaps the most important point. What they are saying is that, look, there is a higher power when we talk of cooperative security. There is a higher power which will govern or oversee cooperative security. And that higher power is the United Nations. So they want to use United Nations, both these countries, in their cooperative security narrative as that higher power which will guide things. As against the American narrative, which is rule-based. Now, nobody knows who made those rules. Obviously, they have been made by the global hegemon. So, there is no higher power above the Americans. They can do whatever they want. So, this is a very big difference in the two. The, so, once we understand that, in fact, it has been more explicitly stated by Chinese President Xi Jinping himself in April 2022 when he spoke of the concept of global security initiative. Global security initiative is cooperative security and is supposed to be working under the United Nations. If I may just digress to make a point, China is the second largest donor to the United Nations and it always gives its money, its dues on time. And it has a standing UN peacekeeping force of 8,000 soldiers. But this is a side issue that I wanted to talk about the importance they give to the UN. Now, besides when we talk of cooperative security, they are talking of an inclusive, not an exclusive. They are talking of territorial integrity. They are talking of sovereignty. And most of all, they are talking of indivisibility, a security which is not divisible. That means it should not be a zero-sum game, that one loses and the other gains. It should not be like that. That means it is not threatening to anybody. And they talk of panchir, which is basically non-interference in, in, uh, in other countries' affairs and mutual respect. Now, this is what cooperative security is all about. And just in case uh, many people in India think that this is a very amorphous concept, it has shown results and the biggest result it has shown is in terms of a peace deal between two arc enemies, rivals, competitors, Iran and Saudi Arabia, this was not signed at Camp, Camp David, it was signed in Beijing. And President Zelensky of Ukraine, he has spoken with Xi Jinping for the first time recently. As Xi Jinping has I mean, already the Chinese came up with a 12-point proposal for ending the Ukraine war. And the Chinese have already appointed now an, an ambassador for the Eurasian nation, for the Eurasian area. The point I'm making is that Global Security Initiative is showing the results and we find more and more countries. Right now, there are 100 countries in the world in one year since it was enunciated, which have agreed to adapt the Global Security Initiative. And we have the entire Global South today, which accepts the collective security. Now, this brings me to the third point. As a consequence of this, the third issue is connectivity. Because it has been possible today, 
something extraordinary has happened because of the Ukraine war that the energy exporters and energy importers they have come on the same side. You see, it was unthinkable that Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkmenistan, they all would be on one side. So therefore, now there is an opportunity for this collective security arrangement for the SEO nations to perhaps look for an alternate route and not the sea route, which has become too dangerous because that is where the American Indo-Pacific Indo strategy will have its sway. So they are instead of looking at the sea routes, they are looking at the land routes. And what are these land routes? They are looking at all these corridors which are coming up. The Iran-Russia corridor all through Central Asia. Iran-Central Asia, North-South North -South corridor and perhaps even CPEC if the, if the Pakistanis can get their political narrative correct. They could certainly then start off with the railway line. So the point, the point to be made is that in all these three areas, what the defense minister was saying is that they want, Russia wants and China wants India to be part of this SEO and it should devote more to the SEO. This is what they want. And why they want this is because of geography. Xi Jinping had met Modi at the second informal summit in Madras, uh, in, in Chennai, where he very uh, straight away said, told him that it is the rise of the East and the decline of the West. The entire narrative, the economies, they all have shifted here to this region. And it will be very odd that India is not in the game and countries like Nepal, countries like Sri Lanka, countries like Bangladesh, because of as I said, the exporters and the importers of the energy, they've come on the same side. Though there is a clear case of now they're working in their trading in their local currencies. Even the US dollar, which is the strength of America, has been displaced. It has not been replaced. It is getting displaced very slowly. That means tectonic shifts are happening. Today, in the global in the global economic order, in the global geopolitical order, and certainly the Russians and the Chinese want India to be a part of there. Now, this is something that the Modi government does not want, as I said, because of the insistence that we are equal or in competition with the Chinese, which actually we are not. And there is no question of catching up. I keep hearing some three-star officers talking about catching up in 20 years with the PLA. You can't. Because those 20 years, the PLA will not be sitting and twiddling their thumbs and reaching for you to catch up. They'll move forward. So that catching up is gone. But we should be part of the third and certainly the fourth industrial revolution so that we get prosperity here. Now, my last point, which is an equal... Uh, yeah, by the way, uh, not only that, why importance is being given? I mean, after all, India is both the president of the G20 this year as well as the Shanghai Cooperation or uh, SEO. But the importance is given to G20. Why? Because A, closeness with the Americans and the West and B, that the Americans are supporting us to project ourselves, to project India as the leader of Global South, which actually it is not. So it is a great exercise in perception management, in projection that look, we are a great nation. I mean, we have to understand where we stand in the committee of nations, especially at a time when the geopolitics is in total flux. So my last point now is on India-Russia relations. A lot of people have come up with this subject that how will they get affected once the SEO, once the SEO in this cooperative security and connectivity and this multi-currency trade, it catches up. What will happen? It is very obvious that the Russians will remain connected with the Chinese. And it is not something that has happened because of the Ukraine war. I keep hearing the Western commentators. It started in 1996 when Shanghai 5 was formed and which later in 2001 became SEO. It is that time when it was agreed by Russia as well as uh, 
China that they need to work together. And today the Russians are, are completely posited towards the East. That is where they are looking. So obviously the relations will get tense with the passage of time and I would say another 2-3 years because a lot of pressure is coming from the Americans also that because of interoperability come and buy our equipment and the Russians are not happy about it. So the point I am making is that we should think very carefully of what has happened after the defense ministers meet because the stakes are very high. It concerns our national security. Thank you.